In September of 2010, a group of volunteers from Niagara Falls, Ontario came together with their camcorders and spent some time videotaping the people, places and happenings of the Niagara Falls, Ontario area. The majority of our visitors see Niagara during the day and most of the photography and video is done during the day. So I thought, you know what, it would give me an opportunity to show some of our nightlife. And when we were invited as artists to the downtown core to basically pull the plywood off the buildings and begin to bring the, the street to life, we formulated a group called Community Artist Niagara. This is Our Town, Niagara Falls, Ontario. Our Town, Niagara Falls, Ontario is made possible by the generous support of the Sedona Holistic Medical Center for holistic care since 1995, treating the body, mind and spirit, acupuncture to hypnosis, pain management to aesthetics, from Dr. Sherry and Dr. Ron Santacero, and by Niagara Falls Tourism. Experience the new Niagara Falls, one wonder after another. NiagaraFallsTourism.com And by the members of WNED. Thank you. Well, my name is Luca Zano, and I have lived in Niagara Falls all my life, and I filmed the Carillon Towers and the Rainbow Bridge. Well, I started um, filming just the Rainbow Bridge because it was originally uh, the Honeymoon Bridge, which was built in 1897 and collapsed in uh, 1938 due to like a buildup of ice. And so that's been there since 1941. The Carillon Towers is a bell tower right at the base of the bridge. Plays three times a day, 365 days a year. It's always changing, also due to uh, seasons. It's an automated system now. That they could still play, be played manually, but it's a, now an automated system. Right now, it's not played very loud because uh, they told me it bothers the customs officers and distracts them. <laughs> Up in the tower, there's the room where, um, which consists of the clavier or keyboard and it's, uh, there's 55 keys on it for 55 bells. And so you'd play these, these levers, they, that, well, they look like levers, and they're attached like through wires to each bell. And then, that, then there's like what they call a turnbuckle, and it's attached to a clapper. So basically it's a little um, device that pulls the bell to make the sound. The um, smallest bell is like even five inches tall, and the largest is actually six and a half feet tall. I made sure I got the, the dates on them. They were actually originally contracted in 1941, but because war, World War II broke out, that the original bells were melted down because they needed the copper and tin for uh, military equipment. The largest bell is dedicated to Sir Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister at the time of Great Britain. The Niagara Bridge Commission was very supportive of us filming. He, he took us you know, up the tower and, and showed us everything. I chose it because I believe it's a very interesting um, historical site in Niagara Falls that not very many people know about. So. I just wanted to get its, uh, its promotion there, at least that, so it becomes known. Hello, my name is Zach Kavas. For my piece, I decided to do Chippewa, Ontario. Chippewa is basically the definition of diamond in the rough. It's just outside of Niagara Falls, small, quaint little town. Right when you go in, there's the bridge. It used to be called King's Bridge. It was built uh, in the 1800s, and they obviously renovated it. I got a shot of Laura Secord's house because she played such a key role in the British and Canadian side of the war. She basically was what appeared to be just uh, a young woman, and, but she would deliver important messages between enemy lines to the forces to 
allow them to know when, when the other invading troops were coming in, where they were going. She grew up in Queenston, but she finished off, I think, the last 30 or 40 years of her life in Chippewa. She died when she was, I think, 93 in Chippewa. Fort Chippewa was built in the 1800s to defend the southern part of Portage Road. And there was a, the Battle of Chippewa took place there. It was in 1814, during the 1812 war. And it was basically between the Americans and the Canadians, in which in the Battle of Chippewa, the Americans succeeded. And there was a lot of casualties. Like, I think there was 400. And for a small battle, it's a lot in, in one place. I think the thing that struck me most about Chippewa was mainly that my dad grew up there on uh, Howe Crescent. It's just in Chippewa, but I just felt I should pay tribute to where he grew up. And a lot of my friends are from Chippewa, and Chippewa residents are very patriotic about being from Chippewa. They, a lot of my friends have tattoos of Chippewa. 295 is their area code. It's outside of the tourist range. Not many tourists go there because it's not that well known, obviously, but it's, it's really some place that they should check out. It's more of a community. Like Niagara Falls is more widespread, like 80 plus thousand population, where Chippewa is more of a small group, so they all get to know each other better. It's a really cool village, and everyone's really nice, and I just I felt I had to do justice to the small village of Chippewa. Hi, my name is Lori Lococo. I chose to do the topic of Dufferin Islands for our town. Dufferin Islands is a series of islands. They were man-made, and it's about half a kilometer south of the falls. There are many islands, and they're joined through bridges. It was named after the Governor General, Lord Dufferin, and you can walk from all of these islands and walk through paths and you get a, a really good concept of, of nature just a few, few feet away from the falls. Once I started going and taking the pictures, I did some research, and even after living here all of these years, I learned a lot about it. There's some really interesting history. In 1794, there was a grist and a sawmill there, and they utilized the water from the river. And then they changed it into an ore mill. And in 1814, the Americans burnt it down after the War of 1812. I've lived in Niagara Falls my whole life, and it's a place that's really nice and serene. I went early in the morning, and I think a lot of people are just getting their families together. So you'll see some people walking, some people running, walking their dogs, little kids throwing rocks in the water. Saw a lot of ducks and geese. Blue skies, beautiful trees turning color, bridges to walk around in, and it's a really peaceful, serene area. The Winter Festival of Lights is put on by the Niagara Parks Commission. They put thousands of Christmas lights all throughout the, the islands, and it's absolutely beautiful. You can drive through or walk through, and you'll see all of these lights on trees. I want people to understand that Dufferin Islands is more for Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls is not just the Clifton Hill, the lights, the hustle and bustle. There is some nice, serene, peaceful things that you can do. You can go there and enjoy yourself. It doesn't cost anything. Have some time with your family, enjoy the scenery, and just sit back and relax. I feel that I'm an ambassador of Niagara Falls. I have friends that live all across the world, and whenever they come to Niagara Falls, I really take it upon myself to take them around, and not just to the tourist attractions. I like taking them down to the Glen or the Gorge and seeing the things that they wouldn't normally see, things that don't necessarily cost money but are representative of Niagara Falls. Hello, my name is Francesco Supermodel Flavio, and I chose the Niagara River Whirlpool and the Niagara Glen. The Whirlpool is where the Niagara River makes a 90 degree turn. And it does that because after the Ice Age, when the falls wore its way back to that location, it cut into another river that was there a million years before and it took the direction of the old river. When it did that, it caused a whirlpool going counterclockwise. 
depending on the amount of water taken above the falls for hydroelectric generation, if they take a lot of water, it, it will go clockwise. If they don't, and there's a huge rush of water, it will go counterclockwise. I give you a bird's eye view from both sides of the Spanish arrow car. I started a walking tour basically, and I stopped every one, 200 feet for about two miles to give you individual shots of what you would see if you walked down there yourself. Coming down the steps, you can see the paint on the people's faces coming up. <laughs> you can see the beautiful scenery. It looks a little dark, but it's not. I went right to where the helicopter pad is, and then I started downstream. So the first thing you could see is people fishing. As you get to the Niagara Glen where the falls was, you know, tens of thousands of years ago, the glen sticks out into the water. There's a nice calm bay and the river gets narrow. You know, when I got to the Niagara Glen, it, it was so calm, you know, it was beautiful. At the glen, there's two and a half miles of nature trails and I didn't walk through all of them. But down the glen, I took a couple nice shots of rock formations, giant boulders as big as your house. Some of the trails, you're actually walking into a cave formed by two boulders that fell against e each other. And the whole time filming all the way, you can hear helicopters. So people pay to go on a jet boat. They pay to go across the Spanish aero car, but no one walks down for free. And what you see is what you get for free, the beautiful scenery, nature. So all in all, if you walk down, you didn't stop, and you didn't chat to people, it's a good hour to go around. Wear good shoes. Don't wear flip-flops. Uh, bring some water, a sandwich, and uh, have a fun time. Hi, I'm Kim Howard. And the group members I worked with were Cameron Ben, Kelly Howard, and Allison Dennis. The topic we decided to cover was James Cameron and Chippewa. Our grade 12 video class was actually introduced to the Our Town project by our teacher. And he kind of ran it by us to see what we thought of it, what we, if we should do it or not. And we all thought it was a really good opportunity, especially since it'll actually show us what it's like to film in the real world and have something produced and shown on TV. We showed some of the water and the landscape of Chippewa, and we also interviewed a resident who's been in Chippewa for 68 years. My name is Sharon Anslow. I grew up in Chippewa. I think Chippewa is a good place to raise children. It's quiet and friendly area. She grew up there her whole life and has never left. Um, she raised her family there. Her grandkids grew up there. It's, kind of, it's a very homey town. We all really loved living in Chippewa. Um, there's not a lot of traffic. You're allowed to go out late at night without any trouble. It's, it's very quiet, especially compared to downtown Niagara Falls. Um, a lot of traffic, a lot of hustle and bustle, and it's really busy there. In Chippewa, it's more laid back. A lot of people who've lived there all of their lives, very quiet. We really wanted to capture the bridge leading into Chippewa. Um, it's a very important landmark. But the problem was they were under construction while we were filming. They're trying to kind of revitalize the town, trying to make it more appealing for people to come, which is a very good thing. Growing up and living in a town where we knew James Cameron grew up is very inspirational, especially since he came from this really small town in Niagara Falls, and now he's a big filmmaker all around the world. Not only did James Cameron live in our town, he also went to the high school that we go to, Stanford Collegiate. Um, He's remembered all around the school, especially since some of his early drawings are around the school. Being a part of this project was actually a really good experience. Um, my group had a lot of fun, especially since we got to cover something that we're really familiar with and common with, and that was a lot of fun. Hi, I'm Daniel Beatty, and I covered music slash arts of Niagara Falls. I just picked that topic because I'm uh, very music oriented and art oriented. I love checking out 
uh, you know, people's creativity and things like that. There was a lot of creativity around Niagara Falls. First, I went to uh, O Canada. It's like a dinner slash show, directed to tourists, of course. Most of the characters that were unique, there was like a guy in a yellow poncho, a guy in a hockey suit. Um, a couple of them are lumberjacks, you know, Mounties. <laughs> People are eating, there's a show going on, you get audience participation. Especially when it's snowing. Hey! Hey! You learn a lot and you're very entertained. I went to the Galleria of Angelo Rosi, and uh, he creates many different glass sculptures through glass blowing and glass melting, and he puts on a lot of different decorations. He does a glass blowing like right in the store, and it's, it's all demonstrated right there. He's made different glass faces for famous people like uh, there's O.J. Simpson, there's Elton John. There weren't many people there that day, so I was able to get plenty of shots. The glass already made on the shelves and different decorations and things like that. It's just incredible. There's actually this band I've been following called Tom Skull, and they actually shot a uh, music video over the weekend. It was with Sunset Six Productions, they were producing this music video. They allowed me to get some shots of the band and other different shots, it was, it's incredible. They played, they were amazing. Besides Tom Skull, I know there's another band called In Limbo, there's Broken Liar. Now that I see all these unique uh, art galleries and music bands and just obviously I know I knew about the falls and Clifton Hill and all those places but I mean seeing the creative aspect of Niagara Falls just really intrigued me to check out everything it, it was a great day hi my name is Dean Tedesco and I'm the director of the historic Niagara Artistic Exhibition Center and the reason I chose the subject matter of the revitalization of the downtown core of Niagara Falls is because we were the first ones down there to kick off the visual component of revitalizing vacant downtown core as artists. Before it was basically considered uh, or looked at as uh, Plywood City like a lot of other towns that uh, have gone vacant and dormant. Mordecai Grun, who is a, a developer, he got together with investors and they moved into the Niagara Falls downtown core and for several years started accumulating properties. There they created the, their development company, Historic Niagara Development. They took on a whole new approach to the future of the downtown core and the investors are Americans. And when we were invited as artists to the downtown core to basically pull the plywood off the buildings and begin to bring the, the street to life, we formulated a group called Community Artist Niagara. The understanding that if you bring artists into any kind of situation, they will create, they will bring light to themselves, and they will begin, you know, the testament of life, which is, you know, expressing themselves on a day-to-day -day basis. And that formula has been used in several revitalization processes, and then eventually, you know, the merchants start moving in, the prices go up, the artists get the boot, and, 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 and that's the normal formula that works. And artists, I think, embrace that, because you know, when we were invited onto this street, it was all through philanthropy, through the development corporation. They gave us everything free. They just said, bring it to life and pull the boards off. You know, they paid the hydro, the electricity, and then we, we, we as a group of artists, you know, we said, well, we all get a gallery each, no problem. 17 art galleries and nothing else on the street. It was hilarious. Niagara Falls is a world stage. It's a great investment. I, you know, that's why they modeled what they did and brought it to the downtown core and I think it's a marvelous thing and I'm proud to, to be under their umbrella of philanthropy. Well now there's plenty of uh, shopping areas um, that have come up, um, boutiques, um, clothing shops, restaurants and pubs, they've all come back to the downtown core in, in a matter of about two and a half to three years and it, it's still uh, a long haul away before you know it gets branded as you know um, a tourist entertainment and arts and culture district but it is you know definitely breathing now and and has a good lifeblood sure we have a lot of work to do and we're still you know proceeding day by day in improving the the situation in downtown and 
Um, it's not a forgotten area, it's one to be treasured now. Hi, my name is Maria Rodriguez and I, I wanted to cover the topic living in Niagara Falls because I love living in Niagara Falls. I came from the Philippines, moved here nine years ago, but moved to Toronto. And then I had a chance to work at St. Catharines, so I decided to look for a house in Niagara Falls. I thought Niagara Falls is a place to go when you just want to relax and, you know, have fun. And so I didn't know that if you live downtown, everything's there. I went to Le Coco's. Um, it's the local grocery store. It has everything. It has vegetables, bread, deli, um, meat. Everything's there. I decided to cover that so that I can show that in Niagara Falls, you don't have to go far. You don't have a car, you can walk to the grocery store. The park is uh, one minute away from my house, and I have a daughter, so it's important for me. People go there to play baseball. There's a basketball court. Um, there's uh, swings and the things that kids love to do. I also went to the Niagara Regional Police Service uh, station, because it's downtown, just to show that we're safe. The police is just, you know, a stone's throw away. The factory outlet here in Niagara Falls is popular for the people in Toronto, right? Oh, because, well, we come here to go there. And on a Saturday and a Sunday, it's packed. I met my neighbors, the, my immediate neighbors, the guy to my right. Um, he's a German artist and he did his own porch and it's amazing. He wouldn't do mine because he's retired. But uh, he bought the chapel in front of my house. It used to be a chapel, turned it into his house now. And he said that he's going to turn it into, I guess, a, his art gallery. He'll put all his artwork in there. One thing that I was afraid of coming here was uh, I might not find some Filipino food, Filipino stuff that I needed. And I found out that there's one Filipino store on Lundy's Lane. And that's good enough for me because they have everything that I need, right, for the food that I cook. We also have an ultra uh, complex, a uh, sports complex in Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls is not just a tourist spot. It's a really great place to live in. That's what they miss. They think Niagara Falls, oh, it's the falls. Yeah, the falls is amazing, but you don't know how amazing the town is. Hi, my name is Ian Mather, and my topic is Niagara at night. I think the majority of our visitors see Niagara during the day and most of the photography and video is done during the day. So I thought, you know what, it would give me an opportunity to show some of our nightlife. Um, Clifton Hill is very active. Uh, the Illuminations is a huge draw. I thought that would probably be a real good segment to do for the show. Because I live here and I walk up and down the hill every once in a while, you, you don't really pay attention to it. But when you're looking back at the video, you really notice that every building's competing hard for the ticket. And everybody's got a speaker going or a sound going and they're trying to draw you in. Scenes and stars from movies and television. A lot of museum lighting, the Ferris wheel all lit up. All the attractions have their own lighting setups. But it's a completely different atmosphere at night than it is during the day. Blondin was a wire walker that used to cross the falls in buckets and people on his back and, and they, used to allow, they used to allow you to walk across the gorge years and years ago, back in the 1800s, and he was a regular that used to draw a lot of tickets and they have a, he's, he's like a mannequin up on the wire, he's sitting in the middle of the road, so it's actually pretty cool. If you, if you look at it quick, you go, wait a minute, but he's, it's, just an, it's just a dummy, so, but it looks pretty good up there. Clifton Hill at dusk is a little differently because you do still have some detail in the sky, which gives you some separation from the attractions. Um, I was lucky that night there was still a little bit of orange in the sky and some clouds, so it was really, it really added to the shot. And also the Ferris wheel at dusk, so you've got some light cutting across it and some long shadows. It looks quite good. The, the giant bowling pin is a sign to draw you into the new bowling alley that they have at Boston Pizza, which is on Clifton Hill. Guinness is always changing with, with records and stuff, and Ripley's, Ripley's has really done a revamp on their attraction. Um, but for the most part, Clifton Hill is Clifton Hill, and, and it hasn't really changed. There's always traffic on Clifton Hill, people bombing up and down, kids that live here, you know, it's the, it's the main street, so 
There's a lot of action. The Illuminations is a huge draw. I was fortunate enough to be able to do an interview with Pete Gordon, who was one of the Illumination operators. I like to change the colors when I come in at night about uh, put the white lights on for 10 minutes and I put uh, the American colors on the American Falls for about five minutes and then the same Canadian colors on the Canadian Falls and then I, I'll run the solid colors across uh, the four we have and then I'll uh, for about a minute each time and then I'll put another uh, mix patterns on run them for about a minute so the people can take a picture down below and then after that, we kind of just run it random for the rest of the night like that. And about every hour, we break it off just the white lights for about 10 minutes. And uh, that seems to be the, the main procedure we both, Dick Mann, my helper, and I both have. When they first started the lights in the 1890s, which didn't really work out all that well, and the first permanent lights came in in 1924. And they've been running ever since. The, the lights are actually from the Second World War. They were searchlights used in the Blitz. And they're 4,000 watts, 500,000 candle power. They are something else. They really are. The power and the, the, the awesomeness of it. To see it from up there is completely different than seeing it from down on the street. They have a gel system. There's five colors. The gels are on panels which slide down in front of the white lights, and they slide up and down. Um, the darker colors actually get beat up real good because there's so much light trying to burn through them. They burn up those gels quite quickly. I was able to go down into the observation deck of the tunnels, and the, the one shot I got, the people casted a shadow on the falls, and the mist was coming over, and they're holding up umbrellas, and it looks like they're standing in the falls of the rain pouring, the falls pouring on them. And I'm hoping that people will spend more time instead of just driving down here for the day and go, okay, there's falls, let's go. Well, let's stick around. They've got fireworks, they've got the illumination. Let's go check out Clifton Hill and, and see what's actually going on. Because so, it is a, a completely different environment at night. Hi, my name is Leanne Culliford, and I chose to do a little bit about the War of 1812 in the city of Niagara Falls. The War of 1812 was the war that had the British fight against the Americans, and it had a, a, one of the bloodiest battles in that war was fought right here in Niagara Falls. I don't think it's recognized the way it should be, and I don't think a lot of people realize how much it impacted the city of Niagara Falls as it is today. One of the first places I went to was the battlefield of Chippewa. Chippewa's battle was July 5th of 1814. There's a memorial cairn there that talks about the people who fought and what they did and the timing of the battle. I looked across the river and tried to put myself in that place. What was it like you know, 200 years ago when the soldiers were coming across the river, uh, climbing up on the banks and, and coming onto the battlefield to fight hand to hand? Americans, British, and the Indians fought in that war together. Uh, side by side, the British and Indians fought. Uh, in the end, it left the village of Chippewa in ruins. When you go out there today, it's a very quiet place. I watched some, and filmed some of the geese as they sort of had their breakfast one morning. Drummond Hill Cemetery is actually located right on the battlefield, the Lundy's Lane battlefield. It was a cemetery prior to the war, a very, very small one. And you can still see a lot of the old stones are there. There is a gravesite for Laura Ingersoll Secord, who played a significant role in the war in warning some of the British soldiers that the Americans were planning to invade. And she saved the British from casualties and a whole lot of uh, I guess, aggravation by walking through fields and, and letting them know what these plans were. She's actually buried at Drummond Hill Cemetery with her husband, and there's a marker there especially for her. Four plaques are dedicated to the war. They are on the wall outside the cemetery as it goes down Lundy's Lane Hill. The four plaques show four different things. One shows a hand-to-hand -hand combat, an American and British soldier fighting. The second 
is one that depicts a warrior from the Indian tribes and a British soldier fighting side by side, which is a great reminder that the British did have help from the Indians in the area at the time. Uh, the third one is of men kneeling at a fence shooting. And the fourth shows another man loading cannon. Uh, they're, they're quite large and very visible. But what they remind me when I look at them is how this was hand-to-hand -hand combat. You had to step right on top of each other. It was a fight rather than anything else. It wasn't like the war of today where you're shooting from planes and long-range missiles. You were there. You were standing in front of your man. And all you had was the bayonet and the gun to keep you safe. Ruth Redmond was a teacher in the city of Niagara Falls. She taught at Stanford and she had a significant interest in the War of 1812. Her goal was to preserve the battlefields and she bought a home in the area of the battlefield and then proceeded over the years of her life to buy another five properties surrounding that, a grand total of 1.5 acres that were all part of the battlefield. She deeded that land to the city of Niagara Falls with a stipulation that it always be preserved as the battlefield would have been, that it remains in the hands of the city and stays as a heritage site rather than ever being developed. General Isaac Brock led the men into the Battle of Queenston Heights, which was another significant battle. That battlefield is preserved in the park at Queenston Heights by the Niagara Parks Commission. There is a very large monument erected to General Brock um, it has stairs in it that you can climb if you're brave enough. Uh, there's over 200 and they're very narrow and very steep. But it, he will always be remembered. The anniversary that's coming up will mark 200 years since the start of the war. The war lasted two years. Uh, most of the battles around here were fought in the second year. Uh, and it's, they're going to try and bring it up and, and make history known, make it more of a living history so people are aware of what happened here. I don't think it's as well known because people focus on World War I, World War II, uh, where there was so much Canadian participation. But the War of 1812 was actually the only war fought on Canadian soil in this area at, at all, actually. I think it's up to prudent on all Canadians and Americans to know a little bit more about how this all came to be and, and how we got where we are today. And there's so many ways to do that here in Niagara. Hi, my name is Alexandra Gasparino, and for our town, I chose to do the Maid of the Mist. The Maid of the Mist is a boat that tourists can come and pretty much just takes you and explores the falls. I've lived here all my life, and it's a big tourist attraction, and I don't spend a whole lot of time down there, so I decided to see why so many people come here to see it. The boat is two levels. You can go on the main one, or you can go up top. You can go all the way to the front. We are approaching the Canadian or Horseshoe Falls. This falls is approximately 170 feet, or 52 meters high. We went on a day where it was a little cold out, so the water was kind of rough. You really hear the waves crashing and sort of rumbling when they're coming down, but I personally love it. get wet, they give you raincoats, but it's a really wonderful experience to be able to sort of just be right there with nature. Absolutely amazing, you go right to the foot of the falls. My favorite spot is up at the very front. You don't have to worry about people standing in front of you because you're at the front and um, you just sort of get the, the best possible experience when you're right there. The water plunges to a depth of 180 feet or 55 meters. I work at the Skyline Tower. I get a lot of tourists who will ask me questions at the Skyline. So I think that was probably my biggest motivating factor for doing this. If you don't like boats, you gotta be a little careful. It can get a little seasick because it's a little bumpy but it's a phenomenal experience. We got lucky and we caught a rainbow too in there, so that just made it picture perfect. Hi, I'm Catherine Cunningham and I chose Project Share, our local food bank, as my topic for our town. 
Project SHARE has been around for about 20 years and is the local food bank, but it's more than that. It's also an agency that helps people that are homeless, people that need help with credit counseling, and we have a trustee that, that works with them so that helps with their, you know, their daily living. They don't turn anyone away, and if they can't help someone, they have the resources to send them where they need to go. And it isn't necessarily like a down story, a sad story. It's just, it's just real, and I think every town faces this. And I wanted to, to let people know that we were as much a real town as everybody else is. And uh, you have another cereal, too. Say, for example, they've come in and they're hungry. They need some food. And from that point, they go into the store. And the volunteers help them shop. So a monitor goes with them through the store and helps them pick out what they can take with them that day. If it's food, they're allowed to visit Project Share once a month, and then even weekly if they need fresh items, you know, the bread and milk and things that don't last, you know, for a month. Project Share helps approximately 2,200 people a month. We could not operate without the volunteers. It's impossible. Volunteers are of many ages, from teenagers uh, right up to, to senior citizens, and they are amazing. The first garden at Lady Scapular Church at Niagara Falls was started four years ago. So we have a half an acre that produces fruits and vegetables for our emergency food services that we can give out, but also we have 40 individual plots. So our clients who maybe don't have a backyard or aren't skilled in gardening are given a plot. The seeds, the plants, the compost is donated from local nurseries. They go in, they do the watering, they, they fertilize, they feed, they prune, and they reap the rewards of their, what they've grown. At another local church, we use their kitchen to teach them how to can, how to make the tomato sauce from the you know, tomatoes that they grew and picked. Uh, so it's really exciting. I hope that it makes people more aware uh, that we have this community resource that does so much for everyone and it involves so many people in the community. It's just, it's huge. My God, where would they go if Project Share wasn't there? Hi, my name is Francesca Zano and I chose as my topic to do churches in Niagara Falls. I pick churches because I think um, they're beautiful in uh, architecturally, aesthetically, but also they're a place of peace. There are some pretty, really unique churches in Niagara Falls. One that comes to mind is the Ukrainian Catholic Church. It's built entirely of wood. The unique thing about it is there are no nails. It's all made of interlocking pine logs with just wooden pegs. But the most beautiful thing is when you walk in, there's this giant, gorgeous, golden chandelier that hangs in the middle. It's huge. It's done the way it would have been done in the old country, and um, inside the same thing. It's all wood, carved wood, gorgeous carved wood. St. Anne's was built for the Italian immigrants that came in the late 1800s. There was such a large community that they wanted to have their own church and it became the actual the Canadian National Italian Church. It was built in 1913 and it houses an incredible amount of beautiful Italian statues. The altar is Italian pink marble, Mount Carmel. Um, it's a Carmelite monastery that uh, was in the late 1800s. The altar is entirely carved wood. It's Canadian white oak, but it's stained brown, and you see a lot of this dark brown wood in it. The reason for that is to mimic the color of the Carmelite habit. That's why there's all this dark wood. And it has these magnificent stained glass windows. The windows are like a storyboard. The top half is, it, it uh, tells you about the life of uh, the Blessed Virgin Mother in, uh, according to the Gospels, and the bottom half is the story of Elijah, according to the Gospels. They also have there, in this beautiful golden and glass case, is the relics of St. Therese of Lisieux from France. The Nathaniel Det Memorial Chapel. It was uh, built by slaves who had come to Niagara Falls through the Underground Railroad for freedom. In the back, there is a library that has a lot of the information and the historical facts about the Underground Railroad and the slaves that came here. 
the church was actually built in another area of Niagara Falls, and they took these logs and they just put it under the church and they moved it, literally rolled it to where it is right now. Christ Church is beautiful. It is your postcard church that you, you're going to find if you're looking for a Christmas shop, that's, the, that's Christ Church. It has this beautiful garden in front of it. Um, it has a Carillon player in it. Uh, so it, that still works, but that is still housed in their bell tower. Uh, Queen Elizabeth, when she was Princess Elizabeth in the early 1900s, visited this church. And now they have that pew roped off and it's used for dignitaries only. There's a lot of beautiful brass, gl uh, stained glass, hand uh, stitched kneelers. St. Patrick's is it's at the top of Queen Street. In the uh, 1800s it was built. So it's a, a beautiful old church, another Carmelite church, and it kind of stands kind of overlooking the downtown core. Stamford Presbyterian, the meeting house was actually in the late 1700s. This year it's going to be its 225th anniversary as a congregation. The actual building is not that old. The, the building that was there got destroyed. It was used as a military hospital at one point. The outside style of the church is the old type Presbyterian church. It's quite a beautiful little church. St. John's Anglican, the building that is there is the original old church. It's the oldest church in Niagara Falls. It was built in 1825. It is no longer used as a church. It is used more as a mausoleum type now. Drummond Hill Presbyterian, I included that church because it stands next to the battlefield of 1812. During the war was destroyed and uh, so it was totally gone and they've rebuilt it since then, but it still sits right next to the cemetery there that houses Laura Secord. I hope when people come to Niagara Falls, they go beyond the falls area and the tourist areas. Find one of these churches, just go in and sit down and look at the beauty, the architecture, the peace that's there. A perfect ending to your day, to have a nice peaceful retreat, your own little daily retreat in one of these magnificent churches. My name is Michael Cunningham and I work with Josh, Julian and Gabor. We're from Stanford Collegiate and we worked on the teenage perspective on Niagara Falls. We really wanted to choose a teenage perspective because we wanted to show people what it's like to grow up here and live here and what there is to do for teenagers. So if anyone wanted to come here with their kids for even just on a vacation, they could see what kind of attractions there are or anything like that, or even if they want to just move here and live here and raise their kids here. We just want to show people the little things that people don't hear about. One of the places we really wanted to show off was the Secret Gardens. It's just a little wooded area down at the bottom of Clifton Hill. Uh, not too many people know about it. It's, it's just a little secluded spot. You wouldn't even notice it's there unless you're told by someone who's lived here their whole life. But it's still a great place for teenagers to go and a lot of teens like to hang out there during the summer. There's lots of other places for teens to go, such as the new McBain Center, which was made a couple years ago. Uh, there's a YMCA in there, and there's a library in there, all that fun stuff. There's also a skate park down on the back side of the parking lot that a lot of teenagers like to hang out at and skateboard, and it's a good place to have extracurricular activities that you don't really do in school. Across the street from the McBain Center is actually the Niagara Square. Uh, it's just a small little mall for people to go to and hang out after school and a lot of teens hang out in there, especially on their lunches from the other high schools around that area. Just down in the Niagara Falls area, there's this boat that you don't, really, you don't really learn about it unless you've been here your whole life, learning about it throughout school and all that. Some people were trying to actually go across the river to the United States side but they actually got stuck on a rock and they had to rappel down from this large power plant that was in use then, but it isn't anymore. But they had to rappel down and bring them back up the rope. The tourist area not only benefits our city, 
but it helps us as teenagers because we can get part-time jobs at all these attractions and rides and down in the falls such as like Made in the Mist and things like that. So we really have the opportunity other than other towns to have all these part-time jobs that we can go have at any time. Niagara Falls isn't just a big tourist area and the big attractions. It's also a great town to live in. It has great places to work, great schools. It's a great community and there's really great places for you to raise your family here and it's a great place to grow up and live. My name is John Robbins. I'm a reporter at the Niagara Falls Review newspaper here in Niagara Falls and uh, I participated in the Our Town uh, WNED video and uh, I think it was very important for Our Town to look at cemeteries in Niagara Falls. Cemeteries are places of life just as much as they are places of death. Of course they're, they're sacred places, they're places that should be treated with reverence, um, but they're full of joy in life too. And I think that in a lot of ways is a testimonial to the people that are, are there, you know, grieving is about overcoming death. It's about re-entering into life again. It's a bit of a resurrection. And so, uh, you know, well, they should be places that are quiet. To see people jogging in a cemetery or to ride their bikes through, uh, I think just reinforces that feeling of life and, and you know, happiness. Niagara Falls uh, and the Niagara region is one of the most, most historic areas of, uh, of Canada. I took a look at two cemeteries, Drummond Hill Cemetery, which was actually the scene of a War of 1812 battle, the Battle of Lundy's Lane, where the Americans and the British fought. Uh, they actually fought in the cemetery amongst the cemetery stones, and there's a, a large War of 1812 burial there. Drummond Hill Cemetery is uh, really unique because it's dead center in the tourist district at Ferry Street and, and Drummond Road. And in 1814, uh, it was the last invasion of Canada. The American army came across the Niagara River from Buffalo into Fort Erie and they marched into Niagara Falls. And on the 25th of July, 1814, a 5,000-strong American army attacked the British, the main British army, right in that cemetery. The cemetery still looks in many ways the, w the way it did then. The surrounding areas certainly don't look like they did in 1814, but in that one little cemetery you can sort of catch a glimpse of the past. You can walk amongst the stones. The other cemetery I looked at was Fairview Cemetery. It's our largest cemetery in Niagara Falls. There's uh, literally thousands of burials. And in both cases, these cemeteries are like oases in the city. It has very unique sections. There's these old Victorian areas of the cemetery with more Gothic looking stones. Um, there's a section that, that uh, has a memorial to the Chinese community here in Niagara Falls. So there's a lot of uh, burials of people of different ethnic origins in, in the city. There's a large veterans uh, portion of the cemetery where uh, many of the dead from the First World War and the Second World War are buried. While I was there, there was a Canadian flag that was flying over top of one of the stones. And I came in for a close-up shot of the flag fluttering in, in the breeze. And after I got my shot, there was an elderly gentleman uh, who was uh, tending a grave of one of his loved ones. And he saw me and he said, um, excuse me, do you know Bill? And I said, well, no, I don't. And I told him about the Our Town Project. And he was really excited about that. And he told me about Bill and he said Bill was a a pilot during the Second World War. And what was really unique about that was this Lancaster bomber, there's only two flying in the world uh, now, just happened to be circling above the falls at the time. And uh, it was, it was kind of unique. What really struck me was, you know, you have neighbors in your own community around your home. But in, in, in cemeteries, it's like a community too, because people tend to the graves and they get to know the other people that come to tend to graves or to relax in the cemetery and, and it becomes sort of like a neighborhood. I was born and raised in Niagara Falls. I work every day here and I'm out in the community, as you can imagine, uh, covering stories and I'm quite often at the cemeteries. And uh, as a young boy, Fairview Cemetery and Drummond Hill Cemetery were places that were like playgrounds for me. So I hope that people look at cemeteries in the city as parks within the city, uh, as museums within the city, and communities within the city where you can come together and celebrate life and learn a little bit about, more about the city through, through the cemeteries. Hi, my name is Linda Jones. I'm a lifelong resident of Niagara Falls, Ontario. 
I've been a step-on guide working with bus groups and the tourists for many years. I own my own step-on company and I wanted to focus on all the people that come and uh, to see our beautiful falls. We welcome people from all over the world. We have a small city, 80,000 people perhaps, but millions of uh, people come to visit us. So that's an interesting dynamic here in Niagara Falls. And by the way, uh, this is a Tilly hat I have on. Tilly hats uh, are a Canadian institution. I shot mostly a group from Mississippi that had come down for a couple of days uh, with a guide and uh, headed out to Table Rock House where they viewed the falls from there. It was called Table Rock because there used to be a large ledge of limestone rock that extended out into the falls. And back in the 1800s, people would use it as a, a viewing platform that fell off into uh, the water. I think there was a horse and buggy on it. No people, thank goodness. But it's uh, retained its name. Australia, we are looking at Niagara Falls and, and we just love it. Right. <laughs> Found some tourists from Australia that were waiting for me to finish shooting. And I said, well, why don't I just shoot you instead? And so that's part of the fun of it, meeting people from all over the world. I would say the Maid of the Mist is probably the most popular tourist attraction here in Niagara. It's American owned, and they lease the property from the Niagara Parks Commission. And I think it's possibly the uh, oldest commercial tourist attraction in the entire world, been operating since 1846. The floor clock is just a little further down the parkway, down river, and it's a big uh, attraction as well. It's a large clock, uh, 40 feet in diameter. It's been there since the 1950s, and they change the, the design on the clock twice a year with bedding plants. They have a spring uh, design with violas and pansies, and now uh, what I shot was their summer and fall design, a lot of coleus and hardy plants for the fall time and it uh, chimes every 15 minutes. We generally head down to the Whirlpool because that's an important part along the Niagara Parkway too. People think of the falls, but uh, aren't aware that all these other things exist uh, along the trip down the parkway. And that's a spot in the Niagara River where it makes a sharp 90 degree turn, creating a Whirlpool. We have level six rapids and people hike down there, great fishing. But the attraction up at the top is the uh, Niagara Aero Car which has been running since 1916. And it's a, a cable car that runs across the gorge from one side of the Canadian Gorge to the other side of the Canadian Gorge. It takes about 10 minutes and it runs on six one inch in diameter steel cables. That's it, but it's safe, very safe, and it gives a great view of uh, the river and the gorge there for anybody that goes across. I decided to take a stop down at uh, Rossi Glass, which is uh, in the Souvenir City complex, because I've been going there as well as just about every other bus group uh, that comes to the city for many years. It's a, a locally owned glass blowing company, and uh, they just do a great job. They provide a little extra for the guests by doing a glass blowing demonstration, and it's just fascinating to see. I guess if you work in the tourist industry, which many of us do, you kind of love the tourists because it's your bread and butter and you get to meet them. And I think that you get to grow as well in you know, meeting people from all over the world. And, uh, but I recognize the fact that a lot of my neighbors, a lot of my friends, even a lot of the school groups, the children, they really don't know very much about the area. And it is so exciting. I can't think of a better thing to do uh, as a career and I would just like to encourage people to come down and to explore the area for themselves. Hi, I'm Dan Frigo. I chose the decommissioned hydro buildings in Niagara Falls as my topic. I'm a carpenter for the Niagara Parks Commission. Occasionally we get uh, uh, permission or access to go into these buildings. The hydro buildings are buildings that uh, many visitors that come to Niagara Falls and local residents uh, see all the time and I'm asked all the time what's what's in those buildings? I chose the Toronto Hydro Building because of its, uh, it's a beautiful old building uh, built by Sir Henry Palat, the guy who, uh, who had Casa Loma in Toronto and uh, he financed this uh, hydro project uh, in the early 1900s. It's a uniquely beautiful building with uh, tall columns and a really nice architecture. 
The building has been decommissioned for over 30 years. There was a lot of moisture in the building and steel and plaster and all that stuff, they don't like moisture. So it, um, it's quite dilapidated. Now they're, they're using some of the buildings for storage, uh, just a little bit of storage. The uh, buildings are, uh, like I say, they're unique uh, because of their size. They're, they're very large and uh, they're, they're using them for, for movies. The Intero power generation plant is the plant located below the falls. Uh, you see it if you're standing uh, uh, next to the falls, you'll see it down below in the gorge. Uh, this building, uh, again, was built in the early 1900s. A lot of the building is under the road, uh, just in Queen Victoria Park. Uh, there's penstocks, I think there was uh, uh, over a dozen penstocks that uh, uh, divert water down into the generators, which were down below that building. The Rankin building is truly the gem in the bunch. It's uh, one of the three buildings that was built in the early 1900s. Uh, it, it just got decommissioned a, a couple of years ago. So it's still in a, it's like in a museum state. It is perfect in there. It's pristine in that building. You walk into that building and it's like walking into a museum. There's woodwork, there's the, the, the generators, there's uh, the offices. Everything is totally intact. It's just absolutely gorgeous inside. Well, I had my son Blake, he was my key grip there, and my friend John Albanese, he was uh, helping me with some video. And uh, we had John Gator, he was uh, the Niagara Parks Police who escorted us in these buildings. Uh, I did have to have special permission to go into these buildings as a private citizen, so I needed a police escort for that. Cool for my son. I mean, my son's uh, 16 and he's he was able to see a view that a lot of people have been wanting to see for years, so it's something he'll remember for a lifetime. I've lived in Niagara Falls most of my life, other than when I went to school in Toronto for a year, but uh, Niagara Falls has been my home. It's a place I love, and uh, I was glad I was able to do this project. Our town, Niagara Falls, Ontario, is made possible by the generous support of the Sedona Holistic Medical Center for holistic care since 1995, treating the body, mind, and spirit, acupuncture to hypnosis, pain management to aesthetics, from Dr. Sherry and Dr. Ron Santacero, and by Niagara Falls Tourism. Experience the new Niagara Falls, one wonder after another. NiagaraFallsTourism.com And by the members of WNED. Thank you.